I'd like to welcome you back. This is the second meeting of the color control course here at the Barnstone Studios. And briefly, we can look at the homework on the impaling wall. And I've only selected a few of those that you submitted because a good many of you had trouble with this. But this, this transition is pretty good except there are all these sudden changes which means that you didn't add enough each time you did a horizontal band and therefore the transitions don't, don't look airbrushed. And when they're done correctly and none of these are good enough, it looks airbrushed. And later we will show some slides of student work and I'll be able to emphasize what that means. And when we talk about tonight's assignment, that too will clarify the procedure for putting down individual touches in rows that change temperature, value, and intensity. So this was supposed to be in the key of red, orange, green, blue, violet, and these were supposed to be neutral. And you can see there's been a great difference in value. This is, these are much darker than this. And frankly, some of you will paint in a blonder scheme than others. It's almost a personality or personal preference. And I'm not going to interfere with that so long as there's a unity in this, the assignment and the color range, though it's lighter in one, a little darker in another, a little bit more intense or a little less intense in different ones. There's a unity and a consistency. And if that's achieved, I'm content because it means you're you're really showing your personal preferences. And if you tend to do blonde paintings, they will all be blonde. And as long as you're in charge of the information and, you're in and you understand what you're doing, that's fine. I don't have to demand that you all think and feel the same way, but I do want you to reflect a common understanding of what's going on. We are dealing with a, a text by Frank Morley Fletcher. And he was an Englishman, and he wrote his text in about 1937. And later, in the 40s, he came to the United States. And interestingly enough, he was hired by the Walt Disney Studios to train Disney's animators and background artists in color theory. So all of the classic early films of Disney, Snow White, whatever they are. I used to take my daughter to them, but I don't remember all the titles. Use color theory based on Fletcher's approach. Fantasia, all of these, had a marvelous time because they had control over color. And that was the title of his book, Color Control. And we have texts for you. And if you bought texts last week, I want to exchange them for ones that we have this week. And if you didn't bring them in, you don't need to, but you, if you paid for them, I want you to pick up the new one, all right? Fletcher is citing a 12-step color wheel, the diagram for which is on the blackboard. And he's saying that he's applying all of the standard principles of color interaction that are discussed by Chevril, the great early 20th century chemist who worked at the Gublan Tapestries and wrote this huge and important text on color theory. We have a copy, a facsimile copy of this in the library. And uh, Albers, no, Itten, Johannes Itten, who taught at he taught in Germany, he also wrote a similar text. The principles of color theory are relatively simple. Colors that are directly opposite from one another, like yellow and violet, are called complementary opposites, and I mentioned this last week. And yet they don't complement one another, they cause each to look uglier. So it's always struck me as being rather strange that they should be called complementaries. But if your 
you want a, a color that's going to enhance orange, it won't be blue. That's directly across. But blue-green and blue-violet will both enhance orange. But there's, a, there's something called simultaneous contrast of color. And it states that if I put down a neutral and I place a strong orange beside it, where the gray meets the orange, it looks blue. And it's really icy there compared to this. So the rule is an orange up against a neutral color will make that neutral look blue. The intensifying blue is going to make that side of the orange look more orange. So simultaneously, the orange causes its complementary opposite to appear. Now it's in your optical equipment. It isn't happening on the board. The board isn't very clever, all right? And it doesn't see anything. All it's doing is carrying the stuff. And as this is intensified in the direction of blue, that blue strengthens the orange. Now, if I come up with a red violet or red yeah, this up against the red do you see the green obviously that gray hasn't changed so what what happens is this we've got the orange and we have the choice of blue green or blue violet as complementary opposites if we use blue green it's going to intensify the red orange side of orange. If we use the blue violet, it's going to intensify the yellow orange side of orange. Suddenly, you've only got 12 colors. Last week, we talked about levels of intensity. We know we're going to stay in one level and Generally, I'm going to stay in a middle-high level because that's what most of us are going to paint. We're not going to paint with brilliant cadmium, very intense colors. We're not working out of doors in the sun. So in that level, how we pitch this against the split complementary opposites is going to affect its temperature. If you'll agree with me that red-orange is the hottest point and the closest to fire on the wheel, then Blue-green is the closest to ice and cold and freezing. So we'll talk about this as being the warm side of the wheel, this being the cool, and therefore if we're using green, we'll intensify the red. If we're using blue, we'll intensify the orange. But this is going to, in both cases, cool the color down because anything that moves away from the hottest point is cooling. And anything that moves from here to there gets warmer than it would if it went from this to that. Do you see what, what I'm saying? So we're talking about nuances. And we're talking about how artists underpaint. I showed you last week the Monet poppies in the field. The sky was yellow-greenish. The, the, the conifers along the horizon were deep greens. The foreground was a yellow-green combination and hovering in the middle of it were red-orange poppies, just little dashes of color. And because they were on top of complementary opposites, they fluttered, they almost looked as if they were being blown by a breeze, they were fully alive, and it was a juxtaposition, juxtaposition of the red-orange on top of blue-greens and yellow-greens, and this game is being played continually. And I talked about visiting people who had a lot of very fine paintings in their homes and how the time of day, this time of the season of the year, all affected the appearance of these interacting overpaintings and underpaintings. So 
there are so many subtle nuances that the well-informed painter can employ to enrich the variety of his color in any given painting. But I have to introduce the way Fletcher is going to select a key for you to paint in, and I'm going to do that right now. Let's say we, we work in the key I have laid out, which is red, orange, green, blue, violet, and there it is. This is the key we're working in. Fletcher says you never use complementary opposites when you set up a key. He says never, then he changes his mind. But for the time being, we're saying never. So if we're in the key of orange, we're going to green, which is one, two, three, four steps. And then we're coming down three to blue violet. And then we're coming back here, and it's one, two, three, four, five. We've got a four, three, five triangle. I mentioned last week that's a golden section triangle. It's a right angle. That's all kind of nice if we're playing with all of this material all the time. But what we have, we have not used blue, which is the complementary opposite of orange. But we've used the split complementary blue-violet, and we've used the complementary to remove to green. So if we have a green field, and I want to put a blue-violet up against this, these are analogous colors. They're adjacent to one another on the color wheel, and they rather complement each other. They're pleasant, they're pleasing. I'm going to cool this down a little bit. Okay, now, if I come in with a fairly intense orange, This is the principle of chorus and soloist that I discussed last week. All of this which is darker is making that which is lighter more important. So the two darks subdue and provide a background for the key color to resonate. So it has the advantage of the background is cool. This is the cool side of the wheel. The key color is warm. The background is dark. The key color in this instance is light. So it is lighter and warmer than the environment it occurs in, and that makes it special. So the poppies in the Monet were lighter, they were warmer, they were intense, and they were played against a darker, complementary opposite background and underpainting, and they throbbed. Now, you have to remember that Monet mixes two and three colors together and almost always adds white. Yet we think of his color as being very intense. It isn't. Every time you add one color to another, you weaken both. So if you add three plus white, you've gone a long way to killing the power of each and every component of that mixture. So what causes us to believe that Monet's color is so intense is the fact that it's underpainted, it's juxtaposed the colors around it that restore its energy, and that here's a master of color theory not painting what he sees. Nobody ever did. 
you know, the minute you look at a sky, and here it is, it's going from blue to blue-violet, and then finally at the horizon, it's neutral, and it looks orange-yellow. But it looks like there's an orange-yellow glowing from beneath the blues in the sky because of the evidence of the reflected light from the sun, which is hot. So you get this interpenetration of these various layers of orange, orange, yellow, yellow, green, blue, blue, violet, blue, greens. The sky is full of color. So Monet would paint various layers of open touches so all of this could be seen simultaneously. But he would keep in mind the fact that he had a dark chorus and a light figure or a light chorus and a dark figure. So it could be a light figure on a dark ground or a dark figure on a light ground, and you stayed with this game. I will show you some examples tonight where there's counter change. The foreground is dark against light. The background is light against dark. It's called counter change. When we do paintings of spheres, the light side's up against the dark background, the dark side's up against the light background. That too is counter change. All right? There's a transition. So here we have a basic triad. It determines our key. We have one opposing color from the cool side that's one step away from the complementary opposite and one that's two steps away, but we don't have any complementary opposites. Fletcher says, OK, if we mix the green with the orange, we're going to get a yellow. Well, if it's four steps away, it's going to be a very weak, weak yellow. But it is, and it's going to surprise you when you see what it is, it's a low intensity yellow. And you have to know that. You have to know that this very neutral color, this really gray color of very low intensity, has a temperature. Remember, we're using three terms to describe each color. If I give you this symbol, it's yellow because it points to 12 o'clock on the clock, and that's what we have here at the top. Yellow is at, one, at 12 o'clock. If I put a bar there, it's essentially here. The circle is neutral. So this is yellow, middle low intensity, and if I do this, on a value step scale, it's a number four value. If you know what key you've been asked to paint in, and you know what level of intensity that key belongs in, you can mix that with precision. But without that information, it could be high, middle, high, middle, low, or low. You have to know what key is, what your triad is. OK, so Fletcher says you can mix blue, violet, and green together, and you're going to get a blue, green, blue. Because they're only three steps apart, it's going to be very powerful, very intense. If you mix blue, violet, and orange, you're going to get a red that's so close to neutral, it's hardly going to look red. But it is. And he says, if you mix these three together, and I'll demonstrate this in a moment, of low intensity colors, you don't want any yellow ochre, it's too light in these mixes. You don't want any cadmium orange in these, it's too intense and it's too light. So you're going to use a range of yellow, you use raw umber, and you'll use Indian red. And you'll get a very dark red that when mixed with the green and the blue violet will give you something that'll look black. And you can control its temperature by how much green you add to it or how much blue violet you add to it. But what you don't want to add is orange. Because you want the neutral to complement orange. Therefore, the neutral has to tend toward cool, the cool side of the wheel. All right? Everything is calculated to enhance the, the soloist. And this is our chorus. And if they're all wearing blue and green robes, 
We don't want anyone in there with a yellow or an orange robe. Hmm? Better that they be quiet and dark for our light node to shine and be warm against that cool. Then Fletcher says, look, here we've got five intervals. So anything we mix here, if I mix orange with this low intensity red, I'll get a red orange here that'll be because of the presence of this proximity between orange and red orange, it'll be much more intense than the red. And if I mix these two together, I'll get a violet, violet blue because of the proximity of this that's more intensely violet, but it's still fairly weak because it's five steps. Anything we mix along this line is one, one and a half steps, it's gonna be powerful. But again, that's because this is the supporting chorus. We want strength here so that if we put a very pale color here up against the strong, which is the split complement, it's gonna make it look stronger than it actually is. That's one of the secrets. So if we come in here and I lighten this, it's still warm, still beige. I'm still getting it. I'm getting the enhancement of lightening a figure on a dark ground, and now it's warm, very neutralized by the white, but it still works. It's still in the key of orange. So we're going to add, we're going to add red-violet. Okay, now, Fletcher calls this a field. That area in the center is his central field, and it consists of the three key colors and the secondary neutrals that you can mix by combining the far points. And you can use maybe two or three brushes out of this because everything's gonna be very, very neutral. And then you're gonna mix the green, the blue, violet, and the orange with low intensity colors. And that's going to constitute you're neutral, and in fact, you don't want the neutral to appear too far over there. You want it closer to the complementary opposites. So you're forever canting things with a purpose of strengthening your key color, sacrificing everything for your key color. Hmm? Now, we have red violet. That means that we can mix a blue violet and a red violet here, get a very strong violet, they're only two steps apart. We can mix an orange and a red violet, and we can get a red or red orange, that's gonna be pretty intense also, but we're going to stay predominantly with these three colors. Hmm? The biggest field is going to be coming from this side, the side of the chorus. But we can also add a yellow at that point because this is a long leg with one, two, three, four in it. And this will give us a strong yellow, yellow green here. We've got a yellow there, a, red or a yellow orange there. We can strengthen these. Remembering again that we're keeping this. So we have one, two, three, four, five colors. Controlled by that triad. All colors are equal, but some colors are more equal than others. I remember somebody said that. Maybe it had to do with pigs, I can't quite remember. But we've got a weak spot. We've got three elements here and three here. And we are missing a pair of complementary opposites. Well, normally we don't want complementary opposites because they if they appear close together, they throb, they are ugly, they overwhelm everything in the neighborhood. They're the bullies. We don't want them. By the same token, they can reinforce and give some power to a full palette. So he says, I'm going to allow you one pair of complementary opposites. Don't ever let them get close to each other. They're dynamite and they'll fight and they'll cause havoc, 
the police will come, there'll be ambulances, you don't, wanna, you don't want any of this kind of trouble. And he says, what I'm going to give you is red, orange, and blue, green. Now what's that do? Instantly it gives you more strength here, it gives you more strength there, and you now have seven colors and a triad. You will mix everything you need from this inner triad. And when you need something a little stronger in the direction of yellow, having mixed yellow up with orange and green, you'll add a little to here and bring it up to here. If you want to diminish the intensity of this, good. You add some neutral to it, and it'll bring it into this field. If you want it to be more yellow-green, and this isn't strong enough, you can mix these two together and mix that, and you'll get something that'll move up higher. You're going to use this program in this key for almost all the assignments we do in this class. And my rationale is that if we do that, you will become so familiar with this key, so familiar with the different fields that you're going to mix in, so familiar with the range of neutrals that it produces, that you will have adjusted to Fletcher's philosophy without being confused week after week by virtue of the fact that I throw a different key at you. Now, I know some very fine color teachers from the academy from years ago and they would throw, they would have their students work like early tempera painters, 14th century, 13th century. Then they would start glazing as if they were moving into the 15th and 16th. Before you knew it, they were being impressionists and then post-impressionists. And by changing the painting technique, he kept this class flashy and interesting but nobody ever mastered any one of those techniques. They were never with them long enough. And they really never came fully to terms with color theory because they were being shocked by new information and new procedures each week. We will stay pretty much with one key. Now the moment you move that wheel, because Fletcher's giving you two sets of keys. He's calling one clockwise, four, three, five, or three, four, five. No, three, four, five is counterclockwise. But he's giving you this diagram here, and then he's flipping it over. So if, you, if this is on glass and you flip it over, this is orange, green, blue, violet, then it's orange, blue, blue, green, violet. Instead of being one, two, three, four, three, five. It's five, three, four. Okay? Call him what you will, it is irrelevant. You'll just see. Did you all read the Fletcher? How comfortable was it? Not bad? Is my talk now clar clarifying it, making it easier to see? So I would like to do on this wheel and um, Lauren's going to come over. I'd like to show you in practice some of what you have to under un understand. Let's talk about the key, the color yellow. Now, we say it's at 12 o'clock. Cadme, I need paper. Cadmium yellow is the most intense yellow imaginable. And if you look around you, you'll see there could be no use for that color if we were to paint this group of people and these walls and these floors. It's just beyond the middle intensity range that we need here. If we come down in intensity, we also come down in value and the next yellow would be yellow ochre. Well, as I believe I said last week, during the 19th century Industrial Revolution, can we do anything to make you more comfortable? 
Could we put a tall stool that you could leave your elbow on? You sure? Scotch? <laughs> Scotch. Well, yeah. But there's too great a jump from high intensity to a very dull yellow. So Fletcher right off the bat says, tune the yellow. I said that the industry did not produce the colors we, we needed, it produced whatever the chemistry offered, and then, it, then be damned, let industry fight however they might. And the artists too, they really, the artist wasn't a big enough market to worry about. But people had to paint cars, and they had to paint refrigerators, and they had to paint God knows what, and paint they did. So if we add yellow ochre to our cadmium yellow light, we get a transitional yellow. We need the wastebasket pretty close. So now there we have a step between the two. Now, we can lighten and intensify that by adding more cadmium yellow. And now we can come down to the next level of yellow. And if we take yellow ochre, and first I want to show you this color. This is raw umber. Now when you hear the word raw, think yellow. Okay, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, raw sienna, and raw umber, pardon? O-C-H-E-R. So if I take this raw umber and I add white to it, I have a very low intensity yellow. Now, I've developed some rather probably corny analogies, but it kind of works. There was an island off the coast of northern Spain that I visited once with a bunch of Galician fishermen, and I found a little beach on this island. The island was called Cias. It was one of the prettiest places I'd ever seen in my life, and there was this little beach, and the beach was made up of these flat shells that Shell Petroleum made its logo out of. They're very thin, and you could hold them up in the sun and you see through them. But if you can imagine thousands of years of these particular shells being washed up on this little beach, and you sit there and you'd listen to them tinkle as the waves hit them, and then you saw the graduations of sand produced from these beautiful golden shells. Well, near the water, it was very light and pale. But when you got up into the area where the sand was denser, and near the water, it was dark because the water made it dark. As you went up and the sand got dried out by the sun, it got lighter and lighter and lighter. So if you think of this as the meeting of the water with the beach, and the sand is so dark, and as you go up higher and higher and higher, and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter, that is your yellow. That is yellow. So if I add white to that, it's a very, very low yellow. And if I wish to intensify it, I could come in with a little bit of my yellow ochre and I'm moving higher up on the sand. You see it. Here it's being licked by the water. Now I'm moving up higher and it's drying out. That's a little bit too intense. But you see the point I'm trying to make. Hmm? This is about what the sand will look like way up where it's driest and furthest from the water. But they're all yellows. And they're all middle intensity palettes. And they are, for the most part, generated by the yellow ochre. If I come in and I need a green, I'm going to mix my neutral up, and I mix these two together, 
I want to first of all show you that every color, every pigment has different levels of strength. We'll call that staining power. That has great staining power. It's a glazing color. This is a dead color, meaning it isn't a glazing color. It isn't transparent, it's opaque. And if I add a little bit of white to this, it immediately gets chalky. Hmm? I add the tiniest bit of white to that, it still is extremely powerful. So we're going to have this term. The phthalo color has great staining power. A sixteenth of that, sixteenth of an inch of that will be powerful. You can add a lot of white to it, a lot of other things, it's going to overwhelm. It has such strong staining power. This on the other, see if you can find a viridian or a green earth, terra vert. That one right there might be terra vert. So this has great staining power, this has less. And if you go to something called terra vert, which means a green earth, it has almost no staining power. Here's an example of a green earth, terra vert. What is it? Terra vert, V-E-R, V-E-R-T-E, terra vert. And terra simply means earth. So, where did I put it? Right here. <laughs> you see it, it just looks dirty. And if I use a little white to, to beef it up, you see how weak it is. That's almost a neutral. Now, if you were using that level, because you're painting in England midwinter on an overcast day, you're painting in Holland, which is even further than London, north, and it's overcast, and the sun only comes up for a brief minute every winter, and if you're asleep, you miss it. You know, the winters in England are dark, dark, dark. And the summers, the sun never sets. You, have, you, you can't believe how far north they are. So, with these low intensity colors, you have colors that would be suitable for these transitions. See how nicely all of this goes together? And if you come in and you've got a red orange here and you add a little bit of white to it because this is what Monet would do. See, it's a very low intensity red orange. But if I mix that with a little of this and that, look at how harmonious they are because they're not fighting against things that are too intense that have no business coming to the same party. Do you see it? And I, t I told you last, last week that I would go to the Met or to the National in London and I'd see a couple of art students copying a painting. And the painting is a root four, a double square. They're painting it in an eight by 10. And they've got these colors laid out while, they, while they're painting a painting that was painted three or four hundred years before those colors were even dreamt of. <coughs> so little do they know about what they're doing, all right? So we're talking about levels of intensity. We're talking about always letting the strength of the sun determine what we do or the strength of the, the artificial light environment we're working in. And we are thinking in terms of a simple triad to control what we do. So here we have green. And if I come here at my key color, which is red orange, I'm going to use a little burnt sienna. I'm going to use quite a bit of cadmium red. But this cadmium red goes in the direction of orange. Some reds go in the direction of red-violet. 
others go toward the orange. I chose one that went toward the orange. And I now have a color that I'm going to use to make a neutral. I could have made it darker, all right? But I'm going to leave it at this. So there's my red-orange. And the blue-violet is good right out of the tube. So I'm going to take a bit of blue-violet. I'm going to add some of my green to this. And what I'm looking for is something that will fall between blue and green. So we're boxing a compass, we'll see it's blue, 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 green, all right? Falling about there. And because these colors are so very dark, it becomes necessary to add a bit of white to reveal their temperature, because that almost looks black. Now, we can see that it's going toward blue rather than green, but I just want to see what's going on. And I'm going to need more blue in that, I think. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to tune this again so it's going to the blue, green, blue that I want. What green did you mix with? I mixed thalo green and viridian. I had a low and high intensity green. And the intensity in thalo was that it was a, a, a very, very high staining power color. Just the chemistry of it was that. So here I'm going to put this at that point for the time being, I'm going to use a tiny bit of white to reveal its temperature. So that's the blue, blue, green I want. Could be a little bit more green, we'll leave it. And now I'm going to take my earthy red-orange and I'm going to mix some of this with it and I don't need too much because Remember, the thalo green had such power, staining power, and these don't have it. So let's see what I get. Remember, we don't use the term brown ever. Brown is high or low intensity orange. All right, we won't say brown. And if you're talking in polite company and somebody's using the term brown, don't correct them because they might have a PhD and they'll injure you. Okay. I'm mixing the blue violet and the green with the red orange. I'm after a black. I'm after a neutral. So I have to test this and see what I have. Well, I want you to know, for a beginner, that is not bad. In the event that we decide that that is too pink, we'd say if it's too red, we'd add a little green to it, the complementary opposite. So I'll add the green. But I think that gray was as good as you can get. Okay? So this now will reside in the middle. However, when you're actually painting, I'm going to suggest that because all of my instructions will give you a symbol that means temperature, intensity, and value, I'm going to ask you to create the value first. So if I say it's a number three value and you've got your value <coughs> step scale, you're going to come in and you're going to add these together. Until 
Is there a value step scale on that wall beside you, Michael? Now I'm going to assume that I've come pretty close to a number five value. And if this is white, two, three is there. And I'm down to, according to this, a number six. So I'd encourage you to get one of these from Dick Blick if we don't have any left and use it. Which simply means now I have to tune that up and lighten it So this gives me, I'm presuming, close enough to a number three. There we are. All right, one, two, three. And if that's what I asked for and I said a A blue green at a number three value and very low intensity. There we are. Are you with me? Now, if When I add the blue-green to this mixture, not if, when I do, you witness that the mix that results is darker than the original because I added a darker color. So to correct this, you'd have to add a little white. So you're forever moving a little up and a little down. I was a propeller mechanic in the Air Force during the Korean War. And I was fascinated with what the propellers did. Because they moved in their sockets, every blade. Every blade on the propeller moved. The, the, the pilot set the, the fuel consumption, the throttles in a certain position, turned on the automatic propeller, and the automatic propeller controlled how much torque was on the engine and how fast the engine ran or slowed down, and when they landed, the propeller went through reverse and then pushed forward. And if you lost an engine, the propeller feathered so it didn't windmill and vibrate the engine without any oil pumping through it from exploding and ripping the wing off. And you have to remember the wing was a fuel tank, so you didn't want an explosion in the, in the fuel tank. And there's no fuel in the world as volatile as aircraft fuel. It's as pure and it's terrible stuff. To control that propeller so that you didn't shoot electricity out to the motor in the nose and have it override what you want, you had commutator switches and all kinds of little things that set tiny, tiny, tiny bits of uh, energy to the motor. So it would just barely move. Because if you gave it a shot of straight whiskey, it would go crazy. You didn't want this. You have to make those kind of fine adjustments continually. And the more you paint, and the more you think this way, and the more you limit the number of colors, and you lay out a whole range of grays to start with, somewhere I read somebody said, Mix your colors very slowly so that you can paint quickly. I have somewhere at home, I'll see if I can find it, and I'll bring it in so that you people can watch it. And there's a fellow describing mixing up a brown school palette. This would be raw sienna, raw umber, this would be Prussian blue, it would be terra vert, it would be viridian, it would be maybe Indian red, all low intensity colors. The kind of colors that Van Dyck and Rubens and the Egyptians used. 
it took him 40 minutes to mix the tints, which are all of his mixtures with white, the tones, all of his mixtures with black, and a range of tints and tones for every one of the colors he laid out, though there were only five of them. And this was standard practice. Now, of course, if you were Peter Paul Rubens, you had flunkies to do this for you. Fair enough. Rubens would simply do the sketches for paintings that would be the size of that wall. He'd send them down to his studio, and a team of artists would enlarge them. They would lay in the backgrounds. They'd lay in the underpainting. And if the client wasn't paying top dollar, Rubens wouldn't touch it. But remember, he had Van Dyck as an assistant and Schneider as an assistant. He had professional artists, and he was producing about two or 3,000 masterworks. And the ones that he touched were because the patron was paying the top dollar. They wanted his best. But you could buy whatever you could afford, and he, he, he would pump this stuff out. So we have a neutral. We have a triad. And we have secondary colors here. So this is going back to what I said the sand will look like because we're back to yellow. So you can see right off the bat I've got too much green. So I'm coming in here. and I'm back to the sand of the beach. Okay? And if I take some of this red-orange and I add a bit of my blue-violet, I'm getting a violet. I want a violet-red. I have a feeling I need a little bit more red-orange. Notice I clean my brush knife immediately after every mixture. We don't want any color from that mix to interfere with this field or anything here with that field. You will always use a different brush for each of these and maybe a brush for different corners of your interior triangle. So I'm going to add a little bit more red to this because I want a red-violet. And I'm going to start showing you how we can intensify and neutralize everything. So there I've got a violet, a rather nice violet. But I need to intensify it. And please don't look. I, I'm going to, to something very much more powerful to bring it around to red-violet. Remember, Fletcher calls this tuning, and this is what you have to do. So now I'm buying this as a low-intensity violet, and if I wish to intensify it, because I'm allowed red-violet right out of a tube, and that's a lizard crimson. Now, this is on your sheets. Your sheets list all the colors in a middle intensity palette. And they miss, and it lists which colors you mix together to tune for any one of these points. So you have all that. I've done all that work for you. So I'm adding a little bit of greater intensity to this. And there we go. See it? This is now going closer to that. I could add more to it. This is getting closer to the outside. I could add some of this to this. Now I've dropped that down so it falls between this and that. And if I add a little bit of white, you can see 
how neutral that's getting. And then, if I come in here, and I add some of this neutral to that, I'm now inside that zone where everything is neutralized and you're in for some surprises because you're going to see colors that are so pretty. Hmm? So delicate. They're going to remind you of petals on flowers, on the transparent qualities and seashells. You're going to see nature all around you. And when you come into the greens for foliage, you'll begin to understand where the impressions get their color. And their color almost always come from in here. It's rarely very, very, very strong. So here, let's, let's take some of this yellow neutral take a little bit of this terra vert and a little bit of this which has a little more powerful green in it. Bring that here. I'm going to add some white to it. If I bring it up here and I come in with a little bit of this yellow at this point, I'm raising the, the, the intensity of that because it's too low. It has to be between cadmium yellow light and yellow ochre. So now I have something that's suitable and now you can begin to see what delicate greens you can play with, how, if you wish, you can make them even more delicately yellow if you want to intensify them because the sun is striking you can raise that a tiny bit hmm? if you wish you can come in here and you can reduce this in intensity it's still a green I'm going to have to add more green to it, aren't I? There we are. <laughs> I mean, you've got control over everything. Now, ideally, after this course is over, I'm going to ask you to spring for the best reproduction you can of an impressionist, a post-impressionist artist whom you greatly admire, Monet, maybe Manet isn't too much of an impressionist, but he's sort of a post-impressionist. But Monet, Pizarro, Sisley, hmm? Corbet, no. Corbet is a realist, a romantic. He's still brown school for the most part. He won't help you in this regard. But there are a bunch of, of pe people who were around uh, Monet. And they really were interested in what he was doing. And you can start recognizing what the underpainting is only in recently published art books because the advent of digital reproduction and digital photography has produced art books where you can really see what the underpaintings are. They're separated. Before you couldn't see because the quality of reproduction was so poor. The newest books on Van Gogh's painting reveal him to be one of the greatest colorists to have ever lived. And I'm sure that Pizarro, if anybody's done something recently with the modern technology, also will be revealing. So, you know, Fontaine Latour I'll show you tonight, he's not an impressionist, but oh boy, these people are master colorists. Even Ang will surprise you. If you go to the Frick collection and you look at the paintings of Ang, in that collection, you will see the neutrals and grays that are, oh, they'll make you cry. And the, the brown school painters of 17th century Holland and their still lives, you feel as if you walk in and around them, their mastery of value. 
and they're using almost nothing in the way of intense color because everything is so down to earth and basic. Your homework is going to be to fill a diagram of this palette with tiny touches of color. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'm going to ask you to mix an orange yellow here. And I'm going to ask you to mix a yellow, yellow orange here. So I've got this at this point, okay? Remember, I've got yellow ochre with cadmium orange. I've got a little bit more yellow orange here. I'm coming into something more orange there. Then I'm going to come in with a little bit of more orange here. And then when I get to this, I'm going to be, that's too intense. call that an orange red and I'm going a little a little white so you can see it because it's fairly low so there's my red orange and I'm going to take this and a little of that and I'm going to take this and a little more of this and I'm going to take this and a little of this I'm going to take this and a little of that I'm going to take this and a little of this. And I'm going to mix along this line. And you've got to make sure that your mix here is <coughs> over the, the violet red on this side and yellow orange of low intensity here. And then you're going to have all these neutrals inside. Hmm? And then you're going to have this sequence going out to all the others. Now, this is positive torture. And my psychiatrist says, I'm free to do this. Okay? And boy, I eat it up. Yes, Jenny. Are you going to give us all the same size? You're going to make a smallish wheel. If you did it this size, you'd be at it forever. If you look on this back wall, these are the assignments. Okay? The Lex pigment, but you still have all the transitions. And because these colors are so incredibly dark, I'm going to have you add white paint to the darker colors because without that you really won't know what they are. Now you know. And that might be too dark. You know, people ask me, what's enough? And I said, well, when you've done it and you bring it in, if it's enough, notice Myron smiles. If he frowns, you've evidenced bad taste. What can I tell you? Because when push comes to shove, this is really, really what we're talking about. Your ability to assess accurately what 
temperature, value, and intensity you need for a specific instance. And if I train students who can hit this, you know, Ian thrives on the fact that he can match any value. It took him three years. He had a class at an opposition school and he frightened the daylights out of the teacher because he had this information that in spite of her doctorate degree, she didn't understand. She just thought you chose some nice colors and played around and then you painted. When she saw what he was doing, she was thoroughly intimidated. And she used to look at his work out of the side of her eye because she didn't want to have to comment. She had no clue as to what he was doing. And he was just being very polite and keeping his mouth shut and sitting on the back of the class. And he was still very threatening. He was a 6,000 pound gorilla inconspicuously sitting in the middle of her class. So, you will mix a line of color along this leg and that and that leg. And then you'll mix to fill it. Now because I want you to have a fairly large plate glass for your palette. It needn't be round. That would be more expensive than you need to worry about. But call Walmarts. Ask to speak to the furniture department. And ask if they sell round pieces of glass for coffee tables, for little tables. Yes? You can go to Lowe's and they will cut a piece of glass for you. Yeah, uh, that's not my concern. That's not my concern. What I'm recommending that if you go to Walmart's, you call them first and you ask to speak to furniture department and say, I bought a small round table with a round piece of glass that goes on it and it broke. Do you have replacements? And if they say yes, run, do not walk. They're dirt cheap. It's Walmart's after all. And you have a very nice palette. And it's heavy enough, so when you're working on it, it's not going to break. And you cut a circular wheel. And this is a piece of heavy card on top of this styrofoam foam core. So you can have a clockwise key on one side and a counterclockwise on the other side and you can point it in any direction you wish and by so doing you have a way of laying out your color and mixing it here and you might want a piece of plate glass and as I say as as Ginny says you can go to Lowe's <coughs> but you want something that's about three sixteenths you want plate. You don't want anything too thick. And you could have your separate palette over here. And you want your diagram here too. Because if you're thinking the color wheel, you're going to reach a point where you almost believe that's a world in which you occupy a front row seat. You're going to be thinking lines and relationships and mixtures and levels of intensity and shifts in temperature, you're going to be, you're going to adopt the mindset of those artists who are absolutely besotted with color. And who were they? Well, clearly, after Chevril invents this understanding of color based on what industry is providing the artists in the Industrial Revolution, you had Monet, you had Pizarro, you had Cayabot, you had all of the post-impressionists, all of the impressionists, and you had the futurists and the vorticists. The vorticists were in Russia, the futurists were in Italy, and they were all absolutely fascinated with color. And you can turn to Baccioni for Italy or some of those in Russia and oh boy, and then in this country, we had Frank the McDonald Wright, 
we had a whole bunch of Impressionists. And if you go to, is it, is it Doylestown has a marvelous museum? They've got the New York Expre Impressionists and Post-Impressionists who are living in New Hope in the Doylestown area. And boy, you'll see this color everywhere you look. And the neutrals and the underpaintings. So that uh, we might even plan later in the semester to meet on a weekend and walk through that museum. Because it's close, you know, and they've got huge paintings. And enough of them are fine examples of what this is all about. So we're only talking about those artists who had modern color available to them and who were so excited with color that it came first. Now, if you look at the paintings of the Fauves, do any of you know who the Fauves are? Who? Matisse. Matisse, Dufy. There were a number of them. And, pardon me? Chagall? I don't think so, no. He might come to Paris, but, and he's probably a near contemporary, but he's more influenced by Russian folk and Picasso and this sort of thing. He's a symbolist. For these people, color was everything. And I showed you the painting by Dufy of the beach scene. And I showed you two reproductions of it last week. And the, the, the difference between the two was night and day. You couldn't believe that color photography and color printing could miss as much as they did what the, what the original must have looked like. But I use that as a, a warning to you this is a problem. This is a real problem, reproduction. So I will show you a bunch of paintings this evening, and I'll point out how all of this works. Fletcher gives you a basic triad, and he says try to, through mixing these three colors and creating secondary neutrals, because that's what that red violet is when you put blue violet and red orange together to secondary neutral. If you mix, mix all three together here, that's a tertiary mixture, that means three. So that's a product of three colors mixed together. So you have one, two, three secondary, and you have a tertiary mixture here. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I should charge you extra for. But because we're friends, I'm just gonna throw it in. Did you ever go to beach vendors was selling kits to chop tomatoes on the pier. I grew up in Portland, Maine. And I, also, I always summers went to uh, the pier, the Old Orchard Pier. And they had all these people selling things. And they gave you these specials, you know. So I feel like I'm a pitch man at, 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 at the beach, at, the, at Old Orchard Beach. When you're mixing color and you want to reduce the intensity of one of the key colors, Never mix any of the, now Fletcher doesn't tell this, tell you this, but I'm your friend. Don't mix the central neutral with any of these points. It will instantly produce mud. Caca Mix a little with the neutral you create. What you can do is take this and this here and mix them together. We now have a neutral that has almost none of the orange in it. This has about a third of orange. Therefore, This is cool. And when we mix it with this, it's clean. And if we take this here and we use this neutral, even though that's essentially what Fletcher suggests it's dirty. 
So you can mix those. You, remember, you've got this one, and you can come in. Remember, you're going to learn how to do all this. So now you've got a violet here, and you have this at this point. And you mix these together. Might need a little bit more of that, but you're beginning to see what I'm talking about. So now we can go down and it'll stay blue-violet and it doesn't go muddy. See how pretty and clean it is? Hmm? The same here. You want to reduce this, you can mix this and this together and then you mix that with this. Again, you don't want any great amount of those colors to get into it. Fletcher doesn't tell you that, and it's a shame. But you know, I, I used this palette for about 45 years. Therefore, when I came to teach it, I bumped into most of the situations and problems that might crop up. So, are there any questions about anything that I have been talking about so far? When you're planning uh, a project and you're doing all the mixing for it, do you tend to make more than you think you're going to need of a mixture so that you have an excess if you need it? Initially, you are probably going to commit overkill and have paint to throw away. And almost better that than to keep running out and being annoyed because you have to stop great mixing again. My experience is you're going to be working in small areas of your canvas and you may not need any of the colors from over here, so you won't even mix them up. You'll set out the few colors you need. And in looking at your color wheel, you'll think in terms of paths. In this homework, I asked you to go from red-orange to blue-violet. And because these are painted in horizontal rows and you're going from light and warm to dark and cool, <coughs> this in some respects is a little bit more successful. The transitions are very gentle. So we were going from red-orange to blue-violet. This is the path. Well, at this point, it's going to be pretty neutral, isn't it? As close as it is to the neutral. So, if you mix this up, and you mix your red-orange with it to come over to here, and then you mix this up with that, and you come in this way, preferably you mix in one direction. If you don't quite get there, or you end up over here, no one will know but you. But what you don't want is an oh my God. <coughs> One moment, please. Because an oh my God means that you suddenly panicked, you had a fixed target, and you didn't think you would get it, so you study, suddenly added more white or more dark or more intense, and you got a big jump, <coughs> and you ruined everything. But if the transition is wonderfully delicate from warm to cool, from warm to neutral to more intensely cool, and that progress is smooth, that success, and how far or how far before or after your target you hit, no one but you will know, and it's going to be small change and the oh my god would have been to ruin everything, add too much to the wrong color, panic, and then see, I, see Myron doesn't smile. Because you can move along, this is all in one field, do you see it? When you come across to here, you've got to mix everything with that neutral and then start mixing this with the neutral to go up. If you mix this with that, Fletcher rolls over in his grave. Because he calls that surreptitious mixing, and you immediately get mud, and you get what the art schools tell you to do. Mix complementary opposites. And we're going to avoid that like a plague. 
and in the process, the result will be, our color will be almost too clean. But you're going to realize how beneficial it is to mix your neutral first before you start adding temperature. Please. So the, the mix to avoid then is which one? Which is the mix to avoid? Because I thought you were supposed to avoid mixing on that. We were to avoid mixing anything here with anything there or here. We work in this triangular field. We can do anything we want in here. We can do anything we want here or there, but we will not, not mix this with that or this with that. But you can mix that set, you can mix any of these with anything inside. <coughs> okay, let me, let me review what I said last week when I gave you the color symbols. Did, did the text reinforce that? There was enough of that text to give you the information you needed. So I'm going to ask you to tell me what these are. We said this was low intensity yellow at number four. This is what? Blue green. Number five value. Very high intensity. Probably you'll never use it that high, all right? And then this. Right, number two value, middle intensity. So easy. So, but it's so good. Now, rem now, something else I must mention. Have my drink, please. Thank you. I haven't spoken about this in this way often in the past, but I think I've been remiss. Because when I talk about the chorus, and I say the chorus is cool for a warm keynote, and the chorus is warm for a cool keynote, what I'm also saying is the overall temperature of a particular painting is either warm or cool. You know, you get mornings, and you're doing a still life in an art school and you're working so hard, you come back in the afternoon and you can't understand why everything you painted in the morning is wrong, so you rub it out and you start noticing how much warmer the color was than you saw in the morning. And you torture yourself like this for a good few months before the instructor might come in and see what you're doing and say, no, 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 if you paint in the morning, you don't paint in the afternoon. And you said, Oh, that's my problem. And you say, why? He said, because in the afternoon the color's warm and in the morning it's cool. And as he leaves the room, you think, why you so and so? Why didn't you tell me that three months ago? Why is no one paying attention to my making such a common mistake and not giving me any instructions so I can avoid a common error? So you don't paint from nature in the morning and the afternoon on the same piece, unless you're working in a studio by entirely artificial light. And the artificial light will never give you the quality of color that a natural north lit window will, but that marginally is cooler in the morning and warmer in the afternoon because of the ambient light. So if you're doing a portrait of somebody, they come at the same hour in the morning, but you don't show up and try and work in the afternoon because everything shifts and it's, you're going to torture yourself worse when you become so sensitized to nuance that you begin to see how far off the morning was from the afternoon work. So you don't want to put yourself in that position. You had a question. I, I might get a little confused sometimes because you, you're talking about the palette being the orange, blue, violet, green, right? But then there are times where you're, like on this, is you're using the triangle of the red, orange, and the yellow. 
No. No, I'm using, I'm using red, orange, blue, violet, green. Same one we're talking about. I said if you can't mix anything along here as strong as you need for a particular painting, Fletcher says he'll give you a pointed yellow and you can mix that with this and mix that with that and then mix these to these points and blend in any direction and that's going to be your homework. You're going to do this. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. So, no, no, you can't ask a bad question. Go ahead. So then you should really not use the, well, I guess the triangle starts at the red orange point, right? But you're just adding the yellow section. But then where does the orange come in, the actual orange? The orange comes in, the, uh, no, no, orange is allowed. Remember, we've got orange and blue and blue here. And they're the complementary opposites. They're the one set. We did say, don't put this beggar near that one or you blow it. Because they're powerful. However, Fletcher says, if this, which is one, two, three, well, it should be four. One, two, three. It's three intervals. If you don't have strong enough color here, he'll allow you to add orange so you can strengthen it. If you don't have strong enough color here, because this is one, two, three, four, five, you can add bl red violet and you can strengthen that and then you can get stronger reds and violets. You see it. He's saying to the extent that you can achieve everything you need with three colors and their secondary neutrals and their tertiary neutral, if you can do the whole painting with those, There'll be areas where you wish you had a little bit more strength mm -hmm. near the yellows or what have you, and then you can start, what's the, the fellow the cook say? Yeah. Kick it up. <laughs> is, is that it? Yeah, kick it up. Bam! Yeah. <laughs> Something like what? Emerald. Emerald, yeah. He's a great cook. He's a, he's a very good painter, I guess. <laughs> If you can keep your means as simple as possible, I think I described this last week. Human beings come in two extreme temperaments. They're either very emotional and romantic, or they're very intellectual and they have a <coughs> classical temperament. So we have painters from ancient times that were Greek, and we considered them classicists. From, the, from Venice, we had the influence of the, of the Orient, and we talk about Titian and Tintoretto and Bernini and Giorgione as being romantics, hmm? sensualists. Well, there are these two temper, temperaments. And though Sometimes Cezanne was a romantic as a young man and there were all these rape scenes with a whole bunch of people running around bareback being rude and he outgrew this and there's no question about the fact that in his later years he was the extreme classicist. Hmm? Technically so, so concerned with perfection. And we look at the early works of most painters and in their youthful zeal, they're interested in sex and terror and violence and as they get older, they mellow. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, any young man who isn't a romantic has no heart. And any old man who isn't conservative simply has no brain. I thought that was always rather good, actually. I'm sorry, I wasn't the one who said it. But the point is, we, we, we hopefully mellow as we get older. But if you feel the need to be a romantic with the power of color that you see in Van Gogh, and he's a romantic right up to the end, violently desirous of producing the most energy-filled work imaginable, the triangulation of his line, the violence of perspective, the rich, powerful color, the contrast between over and under painting, 
he brought an enormous amount of genius to what he was doing. And meanwhile, he's dying of syphilis, you know. Just like Manet and like so many people in that era, Manet inherits it from his father. Van Gogh, unfortunately, hangs out with the wrong young ladies. But his brother, too, died of, of syphilis. It was, there was no cure for syphilis in the early 19th century. And it was rampant. It really was. So, and also, you think of all the gentlemen saying, well, darling, I'm going out with the boys tonight. And Lautrec and everybody went to a brothel to have a drink or whatever. And there were more brothels in Paris, apparently, than there were pubs. Times have changed. I hope. Your painting has to have a mood. And everything that you invest in it has to reflect the quality of that mood, your goal, what you wish to say, how you feel you're going to interpret what you've decided you're going to paint. If you're working from nature, you're going to edit. You're going to determine what the salient features of your subject are, and you're going to focus on those. And you're going to ignore any ancillary considerations that would distract you from the character of the whole. Having recognized what the salient features of your subjects are, you're going to emphasize them, and you're going to exaggerate them, and you're going to strengthen them, because in doing that, you're going to clarify your purpose. Then you're going to choose a key, clockwise or counterclockwise, warmer or cooler yellow, warmer or cooler blue, because now we're assuming you have some experience with this, and you're beginning to appreciate the subtleties of what Fletcher has bestowed upon you. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing this offers you. So this business of selection and emphasis and exaggeration and distortion is the process, because it's based on your temperament and your appetites and your intellectual purposes and your personality, and the influence that previous teachers and painters have had upon what you're doing is going to make that work so uniquely yours that no matter who you're influenced by, it won't matter. You will ultimately be painting as only you can paint. Because these are decisions we have to deliberately make. And I think this is true of physics. If you're doing research in science or biology, if you're going to be an architect, if you're going to be an author, a poet, it doesn't matter what you do, you have to stand face to face with yourself in the mirror and define yourself, recognize your appetite, your skills, your weaknesses, your strengths, whatever, and try and do the very best you can. And I think this is what people do. But we inherit an enormous amount of information. And I'm trying here to integrate drawing and color and design into a whole fabric. And I have the advantage of being the boss. I have the advantage of being the only teacher you meet if you study with me. I'm a sheer tyrant, but it gives what I do unity. The basis for everything I teach stays with us no matter which course we're in, whether we're moving from drawing one to figure to portrait to color to independent study, it's as close, I believe, as you can get to a high Renaissance studio where one master with his apprentices dictated how things would be done during that man's lifetime. And when he died, his family knew that everybody in the studio was so well enough trained, they would finish the commissions that were outstanding, and that was his insurance policy for his family. And if you didn't paint the way he did, you were blackballed. You be creative and you get into trouble. So Tintoretto 
was running the risk of getting into trouble with the Bernini brothers in Venice. And Giorgione said, hey, come on over to my studio before you get in trouble because you offend those old boys and the guild will blackball you and you'll never be able to paint in Venice. And they'll ignore you in Florence and Rome. Don't be a wise guy, you know. The guild has a stranglehold and it guarantees the master of the shop that everything coming out of his studio will look like Bernini, will look like Tiepolo. That's what it was all about. They weren't, these kids weren't being trained to become artists. They were trained to be apprentices and assistants. And very often the master didn't touch these pieces, but they were theirs. I like the story about Dura's visit to, to, to Florence. He's visiting Raphael's studio, and he's amazed because he's, he's a country bumpkin from Germany. He's a one-man renaissance. There aren't too many artists of his standard going. I mean, he used to travel, and you get to Holland, and he'd have a bunch of prints, and he would sell one and have enough money to feed his wife and himself and stay in lodgings and travel on a carriage or what have you. You know, he was an itinerant. He did a little traveling. He gets to Florence and he meets Raphael. And Raphael says, come on, let's go down to my, my shop and I'll show you around. And he walks in and he sees 30 apprentices. They're preparing frescoes. They're preparing cartoons. They're doing underpaintings for Madonna and Child. They're doing religious paintings of this, that, and that title because Raphael's getting commissions from every cardinal, bishop, Every, every, every tyrant in every country, in every city-state, he, like Michelangelo and Leonardo, are being paid in gold florin. They're, they're very successful artists. And as they walk through the studios, the studio, Dura is very taken by one of the young apprentice's drawings. And he comments to Raphael how beautifully he thinks it is. And Raphael says, do you really like it? And, and Dora says, I think it's magnificent. Wonderful. Raphael picks up the drawing. He signs it. And he presents it to Dora. Dora is terribly confused. Dora doesn't have, doesn't have apprentices. Nothing comes out of his shop that isn't by his hand. What he doesn't understand is that this child has copied a Raphael. It is a Raphael drawing. Do you know all the trouble scholars have separating what is the school of Rembrandt, what is the studio of Rembrandt, what is the circle of Rembrandt, what is 90% Rembrandt's hand and 10% some assistant's hand, they, they are driving themselves insane because Rembrandt taught for so many years, had so many followers, everybody was producing Rembrandt-esque paintings, the same now is happening in Florence. But in Florence, this is how life goes because the commissions that come into the shop, whether Raphael touches them or not, are Raphael's. And they fill all of the history of art books. And coming out of Rubens' shop, they're Rubens. Some he never touched, but he designed every damned one of them. And everybody was trained to execute them properly in his style. So Giorgione's advice to Titian was don't get into trouble because you won't be able to move around freely. So leave before you get blackballed because the guild was medieval. It was ancient and it was there to protect the master of the shop against all contingencies, and you didn't want to get into trouble. I'm going to suggest we take a break. We'll return in a few minutes, and at that time, I will show you slides and reinforce your understanding of what the homework's going to be. These are two examples of the Key of Orange. Now remember, in an assignment, you have to know what level of intensity, and we're always talking middle-high intensity. 
This is what we've been discussing, orange, green, blue, violet. And this is the obverse, and it's now orange, violet, blue, green. So where this is five, this is four. That image is flipped, and you have these images in your text. And I recommend that you build circles that you can rotate, and you need little clips so you can stick them together. But with them, you can anticipate each and every possible combination. Now, my view, as I said earlier, is that you will probably remain in this key for a long time because it celebrates light. And the light is warm, and in some texts on color, they say the light is orange, and others say it's orange-yellow. You decide for yourself. Pitch your key so that you're celebrating light with color, and stay with it. Now let's review. If I mix orange with blue-green, I have a yellow, yellow, orange at this point. And if I mix orange with violet, I have a red at this point. And if I mix violet with blue-green, I have a blue, violet, blue at that point. If I mix the three together of low intensity, I don't want light colors, cadmium colors as a rule, I will place that color here as a neutral and it will, be, it will tend to be cooler rather than threatening orange. If I wish to diminish the intensity of any of these three, I will mix this central secondary with this and get two points here, mix them together, and have a secondary neutral that has almost nothing of the blue, green, and violet close to the orange, and then I can reduce its intensity. When I get lower than that, I can start mixing the neutral into it because we want very pure neutrals at that stage. Fletcher says, fine, in this situation, I'll give you a red if you need to strengthen that. I'll give you a yellow-green if you have to strengthen that. And I will give you a pair of complementary opposites just for power, should you ever have the courage to use them. But that also allows you to strengthen this leg or to strengthen that leg. You follow it now. It's all review. Now, the same is happening here, except we're shifting this leg, instead of blue-green, we're going up to green, and instead of violet, we're going to blue-violet. And the others change marginally. And now you can read your text and better appreciate whatever writing you had trouble with on your first time through. Here we have two examples of keys, one in the key of violet, green, yellow-orange, and yellow, orange, green, and blue, violet, red, violet, rather. We're still working with five, four, three. And we are adding supplementary colors to fill in areas if we need them. And in each, we're given a set of complementary opposites. Should we need them to fill these gaps? Or if we would like to have a yellow, green patch close to these, and a violet red close to your blue violets and reds. And they don't, don't want to be too close, but they can vibrate across a field and really enhance it. I'm going to ask you also to try to get a book on the work of George Seurat. He was one of the great colorists of the post-impressionist period. His notion of, pre, of pointillism really didn't work. He wanted the color to mix in the optic nerve it didn't work very well, so he moved away from it. But oh boy, if you look at the way he painted borders around the outside of his paintings, my view was always that he didn't trust the people who bought his paintings to choose good-looking wallpaper, and he took out that insurance to make sure that there was a bridge of color that complemented his painting between his painting and the bad taste wallpaper of his client but he guaranteed that he reinforced the interior work very cleverly with a border that went from red to blue to green to blue-violet to blue-violet to violet-red to yellow and orange of low intensities, and what was close to it was reinforced by this outside border. 
and it, I'll show some of these later as time goes on. But I think you can now look at these, and even though I'm discouraging you to use anything other than the orange key, you can understand what's going on. This is the way you will lay out your homework for next week. You will get a number five gray, and remembering that yellow at the top is the lightest color, and that as you come down, you're going to get darker toward the blue-green, the blue-violet, the violet, the red-violet, and lightning as you come up. So you can do a value step scale separately. You don't have to do it on the same sheet as it's done here. And then this student has laid a touch of orange-yellow there. Now this is the challenge. This is a very blonde treatment of the value step scale, isn't it? There's nothing darker than a number three or four. Do you see it? So this has to be extremely neutral with all the white added to it. But the touch, though it's a tiny bit lighter than what's underneath, <coughs> is close enough to be serviceable. And you have to match whatever values you rub in in the underpainting. So the student has taken this diagram transferred its outline to the page and tried to render this from light to dark, which is the way the colors fall on the color wheel. And this is the way we render a sphere. The light hits here, so that would be orange-yellow. All of this would be the cool side of the wheel. The warm colors are light, and the darker colors on the cool side deal with the shadows and this is essentially what we're going to try to do here is follow the way light would illuminate a sphere a circle now here the student has rubbed in all of this the masking tape creates the shape this is painted on a piece of acetate that you can see through these mixes are close in value that is clearly too light. That's pretty good. Do you see what's going on? Now you can do that. You can get a piece of acetate. You can put your colors on that. Or you can put them on a piece of paper. But don't allow the paint to get underneath the edge so it transfers to this. So this is much truer to what we need than the previous one, which was too light. But once you've stained it and rubbed it with a rag and gotten this change from light to dark, you're going to leave it, and you're going to try and match them as closely as you can. So here's a challenge. Every touch has to be adjusted for the right value, temperature, and intensity. So here's a student working in toward the center, and I discourage you from doing that. I'll tell you how I want you to proceed in a moment. This is a little bit lighter. This is good, but then this keeps getting too dark as it moves in. And that's, that's going to be a problem. Welcome to the real world. These are the mixtures. There's your diagram. I think this student has mixed up more than they need. You could have mixed up just that triad, then mixed up just this triad, and then mixed up just that triad. Because if you mix up too much, some of that paint is going to be dry when you come back to mix, to, to paint the next stage, and you have to throw out a lot of expensive color, and that's bad planning. But when you mix, say, that triad, you want to leave enough here to mix from here to that side. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, what do you know? You have to work out a strategy of mixing, a strategy of transferring, you have to use your head. Painting is a discipline. And you want to avoid mixing too little. It's easier to throw paint away than to start from scratch. So here, you're working through. Now, the palette is much larger than the project on Canva text. So, you don't have to mix everything together. You've got these transitions. 
and you can you will find that you can put all the touches in in the smaller image and it'll work very nicely and you might try mixing one triangle and painting it first to get a feeling for what you're up to now this is the color wheel as it's expressed if you properly light a white styrofoam sphere and you put a blue violet and a blue green piece of paper in there because this now will reinforce a yellow orange key do you see it so we chose this is painted by elizabeth darrow she's on my website she's from north carolina uh, as i told you last week everything she did she sold these are the three layers of paint with the underpainting warm showing through and the modulation of this which is absolutely exquisite and she's using a small brush the one I recommend you use but I'm letting you use for this first project a painting knife if you wish you have your choice one or the other so this is the painting knife and here's a student who you know, you've got to lighten all of these because out of the tube they're too dark and they look black. Now this student might have lightened these a little too much and probably didn't need to add much white to these, but it has a blonde quality throughout that's acceptable. The problem here is these blue-greens snuck up too far, so we don't have many real neutrals. Now that's a real failure because most of your paintings will concentrate on the neutrals in this zone. And if you add too much of one side, as this student did, you destroy the creation of that field of neutrals. But the, the number five value has been arrived at so that up against the dark, it looks light. Up against the light, it looks dark. Up against the cools, it looks orange-yellow. Up against the warms, it looks more blue-violet. Do you see it? This is simultaneous contrast of value, and this is the effect of what we perceive. And if you can get all of those things working, so you will still learn a great deal about what's going on. This is thicker paint being put down, many more interesting neutrals. They are really glorious, and the key here was lightening all of this enough these are pretty much right out of the tube more intense than the other one was so there's a lack of balance between the weakness of this and the intensity of that but we are getting those neutrals and that's what i want you to see and we've got some lovely neutrals up here as well and if you work this way the idea is put all your color down on that angle if you work here don't change direction because the direction of your touch when you're painting gives you a surface unity. And if it's going all one way and then changes direction, it catches the light differently and it becomes more difficult to illuminate. And you see people leaning one way and the other because there's a glare on certain of the directions of touch. This is very successful. You know, this is wrong, but these are glorious. This is much more intense than we've seen on the cool side. There's all kinds of change here. And you're going to discover that there are colors you never anticipated because you probably never thought of these tertiary gray mixtures that reside here near neutral. And this is the same one on the warm side. It's better lit than the cool. And here down near the, near the bottom, this is not adequately lit. And this is uniformly lit, and it's a little chalky, but it's pretty good. And the load of paint on the knife is fairly consistent, so the shingles of touches from the knife have unity. They also follow pretty much the same direction, which is good. And again, uh, we're not as neutral as we might be because this is too intense. These were lightened, those weren't lightened enough, that's the problem. These are some of my full-time students playing games with abstract grids and the color. 
and they had a perfectly wonderful time. In this one, the interior would have been better if it had been lightened because this is beginning to look too dark and we're losing a sense of the blues. This is a painting by Monet. Everything except the interior of the melon and the peaches is cool. This is what I mean by a cool painting. I'm going to ask you to hold your thumb up and cover that and hold a finger up and cover this. In fact, you can make a V with your hand and you cover those two and look, suddenly this is hot, okay? Before we didn't notice it, but now compared to all the cools, it's warm. See how cool that is? Now show it all. This becomes very pale and these oranges still are not pure. Can you see that? They're greatly reduced in intensity. There isn't any really intense color in here. And the big flaw in this is that that cast shadow is so dark, there's no reflected light in it, and it looks like a hole in the canvas. And those of you who took drawing one with me remember my talking about the mice dancing on black and white tiles. And here's the black tile becoming a hole. These are all neutrals. Do you see it? Here's the man who's the powerful colorist painting in grays. Absolutely painting in grays. This is the same painting, a different reproduction, a different book. <laughs> what can I tell you? We have to get to the Met to see real stuff and regret that very little of it is in a natural light. But we do the best we can. This has a little bit more reflected light in it. These oranges are less intense than the other. I believe this is Bona, it might be Vuya. Let me think it's Bona. Now he is associated with the Fauves. Look at how gray, how neutral everything he's doing is and how pale her flesh tones are and how muted all of these richly colored books are. It's extraordinary, isn't it? We think of him as being a, this, this group, Bouya, Bona, these are real colorists. I mean, look at that coincidence, that diagonal picking up along the edge of this and pretty much following her, her pen, hitting this head. He breaks it up enough so it's not too obvious. But you see what I'm talking about, neutral. You will be mixing down your color. You won't be working it out of a, out of a tube, as Vincent does here. If you cover this, this is the key color in an overall warm painting. But the intensity is too great. When you cover that, you have, with one eye closed, you suddenly have such lovely unity, and the blues on the fruit on the right are enough. You expose the blue, and you say, Vincent, you carried color theory too far, you ruined the piece. I don't tell his mother I said that, but I believe this is the case. That's a flaw. This is wrong. I have a reproduction of this in my bedroom. It's in the uh, Coral Gallery at the University of London, and I've loved it. And you see how in this the color's fairly cool, but it's a very cool painting, except for these muted yellows down here. So if you cover that with your hand, you see how cool the painting is. If I showed you a different reproduction, it would change temperature again. Remember, the problem we have here is we don't have the original. Here, it's in the key of yellow-orange. Cover the face, and everything is cool. Cover it from above. Everything is cool. Then you expose it. The flesh is very pale, very neutral, and the red-orange beard, for the most part, is very reduced in color. Nothing out of a tube. Everything adjusted. And under here, he's done this light blue, and he's done it under here as well, and it's starting to happen, okay? Uh, by, by the underpainting, you mean the color that's coming out from beneath? That's right. Puts on top. Van Gogh 
lays in a blue here that is darker than the one he's laid in there. This one's a little darker. Then he comes in with a lighter blues on top of that, with darker blues on top of this. He's laid in this green underpainting. See it? It's popping up all through here. Then he's coming in with some warm touches and some light and dark touches, and he's done. He is so sophisticated in his underpainting that he can finish up, and if he wants a lot of contrast between over and under touch, he, he's free to do it. But he's keeping all of this relatively light, but this is dark against light, and this is light against dark, and dark against light, and this goes from light to dark, this goes from dark to light. Do you see what's going on? So you want to lay the, the undercoating, you want it like a medium, and then you can add the lights and dark? Is that what you could do that, yes. There are so many combinations that you can play with. But if you're privy to this and you start looking at well-reproduced paintings and you go into the major museums that have wonderful collections, oh, you learn to paint. You'll be looking past the surface to see how the creature is built. This has a pink underneath it. Do you see it? It's darker around the outside because he wants the vignette. He has a general value of flesh, and he comes in with dark cools and warm lights. This blue is underneath. He's coming in with all these darks to build it. He's done the same with the hair. These are exquisitely designed in, I believe, uh, root phi rectangles. And this is, I believe, Vlamenka as well. These were the fauves. These were the young artists besotted with color who were painting as fast as they could and running into the, the, the cafes to share their excitement. It wasn't that what they were doing was good. It's that they were tra playing with halos of blue to make the orange ring, and they're coming in with blue-greens to make the red-orange roar, etc. They were playing games with color. This is Pizarro. Look at how delicately muted the color is. Hmm? He's painting indoors. He may have a north light, but it isn't very strong. And look at all the reflected light he's playing with here. And look at how gray everything is, how neutralized everything is. Now these are people who had available to them for the first time all of this powerful color. This is Pizarro again. The same, uh, the same table with the same wallpaper, but it's a, an entirely different scheme. And I think there's, there's too much of a juxtaposition of these warms, and I think he wanted this to be the key, but these are too strong. If you cover those, I believe you'll see that he has a harmony, but those, I presume, apples are just too intense. This is Pizarro again, and everything is cool except for the warm touches in the blossoms. Amazing how freely you can paint when you can organize what you're doing with this authority. This is Sisley, and it's pretty intense. He's English, but he painted with a post-impressionist. And he's fairly daring in this. I don't think there's a key as such. You know, if he, if he had the, everything blue, then these golden red oranges would work. Cover the apples, and I think you've got some unity. Expose the apples, and they violate everything. And I'm not too happy about the truncation of these apples right on the edge. If you cover that, it's greatly improved. I understand he wanted these diagonals running. It didn't work. This is exquisite, but it's out of focus. This is... Monet mixing down his color, adding lots and lots of white. Everything's a tertiary mixture. There isn't any strong color. All of this is reduced. You remember how intense those greens were? Look, white's been added, blue's been added, gray's been added, been really reduced. And, and this is Monet, and I think these are the cypress trees. They're perfectly magnificent, and look at how reduced the color intensity is. Look at how warm the painting is underneath the sky. Hmm? 
Orange, yellow underneath a blue, blue, violet, blue, green. Exquisite sensitivity, key of yellow, orange. And here, I'm sorry this is screaming at you, but all of these blues and blue greens, and in here on the water lilies, there are some red orange blossoms. We can't see it in this. This is late Monet. This is Fontaine Latour. He's going from light to dark. And he's blending all of this so simply that the docks are against this, the lights and docks are against that. He doesn't have to modulate his backgrounds much. He plans his paintings with such economy that he just rubs in and does some dry brush in the background, and then he can lay in all of his figures on top of it. He's got it down to the same economy that we witnessed in Manet, Van Gogh, any of the better painters. Any of the better painters plan what they're doing. This again is, is Fantin. And look at how warm everything is. The whole scheme is warm. It, 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 it generates warmth, but everything is reduced in intensity. There may be some cool touches in here, but this reproduction doesn't show it. This is a New York painter. Ian, do you remember his name? Excuse me? I apologize. I keep forgetting it. He's not memorable. But in every one of his paintings, there's a, a, a violent error. That intense yellow doesn't belong. Cover it with a finger, and you'll see you have great unity in everything, all those cools with a couple of warm notes, and that yellow doesn't belong. Just doesn't belong. I hope I'm sensitizing your eye and teaching you a system for blocking out things that trouble you, and if when you restore them, they don't work, you know you've recognized an error. This is the drawing I introduce in Drawing One by Seurat, in which I base everything on aerial perspective and figure to ground relationships. The lightest light against the darkest dark, the darkest dark against the lightest light, and then we have less and less and less contrast. <coughs> And as I always point out, this sudden change and that sudden change is, I believe, to remind you that this is a drawing and it isn't real. That's okay. It's sort of a game he plays. So you're going to do a value step scale. And if you keep the light values, you're, you're in a high key. And if in a situation like that, mostly it's dark values with a light key note, you're in a low key. Well, we've witnessed this in everything we've looked at. It's either middle, low, or high. It's either a warm painting with a cool note or a cool painting with a warm note. These people are all working similarly because they want their work to have mood. Ginny Tabor, a friend of mine who studied with me many years ago, took a Mirandi and discovered that there was one, two, three, four values in this and the way Morandi juxtaposed these few values was so sophisticated. He must have spent a long time to get these few values to appear to be as varied as they appear in this piece. It is absolutely magnificent. And it's the sort of thing that very few people could appreciate or would even recognize. Rudy Ellett, the young architect who came to study with us, did this grayscale painting of a couple of pairs. And they either look like lovers or wrestlers or both. <laughs> Loving wrestlers, what can I tell you? But the game he's playing with this keynote at the maximum degree of contrast and the transitions from dark to light to light to dark to dark to light, etc. The abundance of reflected light in the cast shadows is really very, very sophisticated for a young architect who couldn't draw or paint six or seven months earlier. This is Mayo. He's not a painter, he's a sculptor, but he did some paintings. And while this is very two-dimensional, I think it's an essay in tertiary grays that just can't be beaten. He's getting the maximum contrast. He's principally relying on value. 
He has no really light lights or dark darks, a couple of touches. What a lovely mood. And all of these warms, as delicate as, as they are, are being kicked up by the cool sky. And if you cover the sky, everything looks dirty. And when you expose it, everything comes alive. So you better and better appreciate how conscious these artists are of playing warms against cool and having an overall feeling in their subject of warmth so their subordinate elements can complement them. This is the bridge at Bartholomeo by Corot. We love it here. It's in a fire rectangle. This is a bad reproduction. I apologize. But you see, it's all these warms in the water and the buildings played against a cool sky. It's an essay in vertical, horizontal intervals. I don't remember who this is. It could be Courbet. Everything back here is a high key, and everything in the foreground is a low key. I think it's a fairly daring thing to do, but if you're, if, but if you're discussing a mountain view, a view of mountains on a hazy day, he succeeded, hasn't he? This really works. So in here he has light and dark cows on a middle gray. He has these dark silhouetted forms with no real lights in here, just a few accents. And then all of this is very closely related. There's a hint of more intense yellow-green here. There's almost no intensity here. And then he gets a little bit more intense as he wants to bring the top of the sky over our heads, but he wants it to dissolve between, behind the mountains. And he is overlapping this on top of that, and this is on top of that, and this is on top of this. This overlaps that. These merge. This, this overlaps this, which overlaps that, which is overlapped by this. You see the game. Overlapping planes. If you're reading Andre Lott, and I recommend that you buy that by hook or by crook, a treatise on landscape painting by Andre Lott, L-H-O-T-E. It's the best essay on art I've ever read anywhere. He was Cartier-Bresson, the photographer's teacher. And uh, he discusses all of these, and he discusses these as screens. And he, he addresses your attention to 17th and 16th century Dutch and Flemish landscape painters. Ewan Uglo is somebody we really admire here. And this is all warms. And I believe this is a violet in the original. Is it, Ian? I believe so. Yeah. Very low intensity, but violet. It's the only cool in the whole piece. So as I say, it's middle value, middle intensity, warm painting with a cool accent. His use of, sec of the section is superb. This is delightfully funny, but all of this delicacy and I think this is a violet down here. And it's keying just about all those warms. But he, he has a wonderful sense of humor. And that's the deadest duck I've ever seen. It's really an absolutely superb arabesque. Very nice. Cezanne's color never, never, never impressed me. It's kind of raw. His composition, his drawing is what's exciting. He distorts everything. He moves things around to create a sense of movement. Multiple views of everything. And he loves distortion. And, and uh, one analyst says that the, he's always using a focal point in the middle in all of his still life objects point back at it and rotate around it. The fellow's name is Loran, and he wrote a book on the composition of Cezanne, and it's available in newsprint, and it's a challenging read. In it, he discredits Andre Lott. I don't think Andre Lott ever paid attention to it. And this is Cezanne again, and you know everyone talks about how, how he models the third dimension. I find these extremely two-dimensional. But he's keying it with that, and I don't think the painting works. If you cover the blue above, there's some unity. And very often he leaves patches unfinished because he wants to remind you this isn't real, this is a painting, and that's what Seurat does as well. So we come to modern times, and people are starting to copy photographs. 
They're called photorealists. And this is junk. I assure you this is junk. This preoccupation with everything being in sharp detail gives nothing importance, reduces everything to an overly sharp focused photograph being reproduced. I think it's a disaster. I don't know who would want this trash and what it smelled like pictured in their homes. It gets worse. It gets worse. This has nothing to do with paint. This has nothing to do with design. It has nothing to do with form. I think it's really the height of bad taste. And when we see things like this, as rich as the Monet, good grief. They were poplars. I made a mistake. It's the second mistake I've made since 1932, thankfully. Delicate, soft, couldn't be nicer. Delicate neutrals, young man and woman back here. All of this advances, all of this recedes forever. All of it cool except a few red, red, violet touches. Moll is a Austrian painter. I don't care for all that much of his work, but when he hit it, his design was magnificent. It was two-dimensional. His color control was superb. This is in the key of red-orange. He's playing with all these greens. The, the shapes of everything. This row, this colonnade of trees going all the way back, this great sweep through is, I think, grand. The oranges under the greens, the yellow greens under, the red oranges under the greens. He's playing ga games with over and under painting. And his touch is all vertical ac action. Doesn't he do a wonderful job with this? The snow scene on the studio, the snow on the roof, and this little accent of the blackbird, and the way he finds his way into the scheme. This is Judy Fritchman's painting of a young girl who modeled here and was a student here. She's now an art teacher. She graduated with a master's degree from Savannah. And it's not a good reproduction, but it's control. The flesh tones, the rendering of flesh, the likeness, the volumes, very successful. Here she's now doing a lot of paintings of women in the Old and New Testament. She's in the key of blue-green. She's really, really doing wonderfully. Sid McGinley is one of the 150 master pastelists in the United States, according to Pastel Journal. She's appearing on their cover again, again I think, for the fifth time. Nobody believes her paintings are pastels. They, they, they're certain they're oils. This is Dot Bun, and she's working up a scheme for a painting. And she's starting with a cool underpainting and coming in with warms. And she shows you the whole process. We'll should be showing more of those later. Here she has a view of a riverbed She's working with great arabesques and major divisions. She's breaking down the reticulated line. And then finally, she's starting the painting. And I believe this is simply the underpainting. And this is the sequence building up to this. And when she did these, she was studying with me. Mind you, she's been selling her work for very high prices for 20 or 30 years. Her sales are supporting her and her husband's living. And he just makes sure nobody gets through to her studio. He bags every call, does all of the shopping, all of the cooking, so that she can paint. And she has a tremendous following. And here she's showing you the inner triangle in the Fletcher, and she's teaching Fletcher. 
So it was a real revelation to her to have this control. And uh, I'm sorry these are so out of focus because this is a stunning painting. It goes all the way back to a blue, but it doesn't work here. They're just inadequate. It is an extremely demanding assignment. But I'm letting you put down the color with a knife. Stand up and watch what I'm doing or come forward so you can see what I'm doing. I'm not going to actually use pigment. You pick up a bit of paint and you set it down. So if each one of your touches proceeds like this, you're in business. And actually, if you can make your color small enough and pick up a small piece, you can make your touches very much smaller and very much more elegant you see what's going on. So you simply get a little bit of paint on the underside of your knife, you set it down and you push it down. And if you add the tiniest bit of color to each touch, and then you have that thin piece, you're in business. Do you see it? And you can keep things so that you can move from one situation to the next very nicely. You wanna, you wanna move a little bit more slowly than I am, but I just want you to see what we're talking about you just have a little on that and you're in business. And then your next one coming in here works. See it? So this is what I'm asking you to use. Now if this intimidates you, you're going to use a brush. And you can just make small touches. Okay? You're going to paint a color wheel and there are examples of the homework on that backboard and you might look at them very carefully. You might decide you want to do something that's not too intense, a little on the blonde side, and you will paint one triangle off to the side so you understand how to create the transition from warm to cool and from intense toward neutral. Okay? May your gods go with you. Drive carefully. Good night. Thank you.